want your sorry ass out of here. You got one hour. I've had so many fantasies come true in this, uh, working on this show, you know. To get to do a Western, even, even a comedy Western. We wanted to write a Western, but obviously we couldn't contemplate writing that unless we knew that there was somewhere that we could shoot uh, that would look like a Western town. Um, so we said we'd written a Western script uh, and got them to run off and look for various Western locations and they phoned and, and said, uh, hey, there's this place in Kent. Uh, that's a western town, uh, loads of people go there at the weekends and um, are cowboys and they eat beans and don't wear watches and do everything in the old western way. It was our big chance to sort of ride into town and do all the cliches, you know, beat people up in a, in a saloon and all that stuff. <laughs> We went there uh, to check it out, um, and we must have been pretty behind with the scripts even then because um, people were going, so talk us through the script. Uh, and Rob was going, yeah, go and talk, talk them through the script. You know, and we both knew there was no script. And I was going, oh, well, there's this big gunfight uh, gun in the street, and they're all, they're sort of like, all the, the Red Dwarf guys are this end, and then uh, the bad guys are the other end. And then, you know, so there's that kind of big scene and the, oh, people were writing notes. And then Rob would be going, tell them the other scene. And I go, oh yeah, the other scene. Well, yeah, and then out, out of this, and then they walk in and he was just constantly winding. And, and the, the other scene, you know the scene after the saloon scene, tell them about that. So we did that, we seemed to get away with that. It was clear that we could, um, that was, it was a great location, we could do everything we wanted. And then we went off and we wrote the script. It was wicked, it was wicked. Long been a, a Westerns fan, really, so uh, the chance to get into this one was terrific. It was your whole Western cowboy childhood fantasy. One of the, the joys of doing Red Dwarf, um, from, from an effects point of view, is that it's got everything that you'd get with a science fiction, and it's got everything that you'd get with a comedy. Um, and in this one, on top of that, it gets everything that you'd want from a Western. And I got to ride a horse. That's the joy of Red Dwarf, really. You can do anything. They can create anything within that world. All I remember is I don't think the caterers turned up on time. That was what I remember this crowd of people dressed in uh, Western clothing standing in a muddy field going, this isn't good enough. I assumed we'd do, there'd be some sort of cardboard, ca you know, cowboy town that we'd sort of vaguely, and there'd be a horse, one horse, <laughs> and a couple of extras dressed vaguely as cowboys. I didn't think we'd actually go to a cowboy town where there were cowboys and you're going, we're in the middle of Kent. It's the in Kent bit that always makes me laugh. It's English mud, isn't it? Very English mud and English grass. It's not, it's not you know, Midwestern dust. But, you know, I think with a, once you add a bit of music and, you know, uh, get a bit of, you know, bar room, jingle jangle, piano, whatever it is um, going, it sort of looked the, looked the part. They gave us a, a very authentic look and they got their own costumes, they got everything. And, uh, you know, for a, a TV show to have that production value was very lucky. They were very enthusiastic, unlike normal essays who you have to try and work into a frenzy. These guys were already in a frenzy. We were wondering about uh, acoustics and I asked uh, whether the, uh, they fired their guns uh, actually in the, uh, in the buildings. One of them lifted his gun up and shot it in the air next to the producer's head. About uh, two inches away from my ear, which made me jump horribly. I think everyone, everyone thought that it was very funny. And as I say, it gave me an ear infection, and I think that may have been the reason I missed the first day of filming. Riding the horses, that was the only uh, problem for me. You know, there's not a thing you expect to do on Red Dwarf is ride horses, and that was that peculiar thing that, out of all the skills <laughs> that I don't have, I can ride horses. I, I grew up riding horses, so I can actually ride a horse quite well. But I also know that they're quite dangerous. <laughs> and Danny knows they're quite... Danny's ridden before. He knows, he knows they can be quite dangerous. Craig and Chris had never, I think, even sat on a horse. Certainly Craig had never even sat on one. But it obviously has no fear. And it's a prop, you know, so we're all worried <laughs> that this horse is going to break somehow. Chris was really nervous of horses. Right, and Chris was right in front of me. My horse was there, Chris's was there. And oh, this, me and Chris really fell out about this. Because I went... Bang! And it's his horse's horse. 
And his horse went, whoa! <laughs> He goes, Yahoo! And it sort of uh, slaps the horse, and they all fly off, including mine. And I'm just, there's no break, you know, I'm looking for the sort of break, you know, can't find one. And Chris is shitting himself. And he went, oh, I've never seen him so angry. He went ballistic. Once the two of them ran, the other ones went, Oh, right, oh, it's the running scene. We better run. <laughs> I've, got, I've got no fear of those things like that, do you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm not a great horse rider, but, you know, uh, Danny's a great horseman. Robert just poodled along, but Chris, really nervous. And me, absolutely no fear whatsoever, being very, very dangerous. There's a very, very short shot, I think, where we all ride in, in I think, in the title sequence. And then there, there's one shot of the three of them r trotting in for a few seconds. But that, there was two and a half hours of us going round and round the field. We shot everything at, at Laredo in a day. It was a director's nightmare, I should think. I'd storyboard it all anyway, especially for effect shots, so that everybody knew what we were trying to achieve on each frame and what was being put in afterwards. And it just, as a language, makes everything clearer. I never thought we'd get it done, and I remember it getting dark as well, and that was all a bit of a worry. Um, and uh, I think Andy uh, did a fantastic job because uh, the pressure was on him. And I think we only had, like, three camera positions for the day, and we shot out of sequence, a shot that way, a shot that way, all from one position, moved the camera. So it was a sort of military operation, um, while still trying to retain the art and comedy in there. Janet Street Porter was then the B BBC liaison person on the series. Um, and I don't quite understand what the BBC liaison person did, because he never really came down and didn't really put our take or were really involved in the show. But I think Charles Armitage, who, uh, was Noel Gay, who worked for Noel Gay at that point, had to liaise with her in some kind of everything's going okay kind of way. So he went to see her uh, and she said, I've just read this, I'll cut out all the swearing, uh, I've just read this uh, gunman's uh, script, uh, it's absolutely stupid, it's totally impossible to shoot and tell those guys uh, they've got to bin this and start a whole new sh show. And uh, Charles uh, was able to say, sorry, I'm not able to do that because we shot it yesterday. And she still is one of his favourite stories. This sounds like one for the Riviera Kid. None of that was actually in the script, that the Riviera was meant to be like that. I, I actually said to Doug, if the cat's going to be a cowboy, he's got to be the Mexican. Because they're the only ones flamboyant enough to actually, whereas the cat could actually get away with looking like the cat. You know, <clears throat> I mean, you had the sort of the big dark stranger that walks into town who'd always he'd be in black leather, and it, but it's not the same as the Mexican with the hats and the girls. And da -da 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 I thought Danny was great in that episode, the Riviera Kid. <laughs> All this, it just he's so camp that lad. You know what I mean? It just plays to his campness, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? We'd got a whole load of higher stuff, and we had this sort of Mexican um, thing turn up, and when it turned up, um, when we when we were loading the truck. You know, I got this thing out and it was just hideous. <laughs> it was so bad. And I went, oh my God, we can't put him in that. And we made a phone call and this guy who I think we were hiring stuff from said, look, I've got some, I've got another Mexican uniform or something, but it's so tiny, you know, I it was made for so and so. I don't know if it'll ever fit, you know, but, you know, I'll bring it. And we're racking our brains, trying to make stuff out of thin air, cutting up curtains, you know. And the morning of the shoot, this um, Mexican suit turned up with the white embroidery and all that sort of stuff and we put it in to his trailer and he put it on he came out and it's the best thing that's ever fitted him it, it was just fantastic i actually wanted every time he did the riviera kid that he'd go the riviera kid and then the, the, then the guitar would fly in and he'd catch it dun, 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 whoom, you know and that's what i really wanted to do and i forgot to ask doug they call me the uh, I think I could have got away with that. Riviera kid. James Davis made up a rig which Danny could, could hold between the palms of his hands that the guns would spin on. Um, so it just looked as though he could do the spin. Though actually, Danny was pretty good at spinning the guns himself, truth be told. I'm twirling these real Colt 45s that weigh in excess, I don't know, between a bag of sugar on each finger, you know. And that's how heavy they were. And all of that, that stuff murdered me because I was practicing it all the time because the cat could not be, you know, uh, looking uh, in any way that he doesn't know how to use these guns. 
and it came from, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. used to do it in his act. And there's a great uh, TV show where Sam, Sammy Davis does all this stuff and he's singing, da 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 and he's doing his tricks and then he, audience, and he goes, well, uh, I wouldn't wear them if I couldn't use them. And I had that in mind when I, I couldn't, you know, not, if I'm gonna wear them, I gotta be able to use them. The name's Brett Riverboat. Knife man. I was the knife man. I wanted to be the gunman. Do you know what I mean? I, I think I got the worst character again there. Knife man. Who wants to be a knife man? You want, you want, you want to be a gunslinger, don't you? I've only been drunk once and when I was a teenager and I'm really bad at drinking, so, although I occasionally try. So it was, it was observational acting. I've watched other people be drunk. <laughs> so I did very bad drunk, but I thought it was fair enough for Crichton to be quite a bad drunk. It was Rocky who came up with this yeah, cracking idea that the simulant space craft would have the design of one of those cow skulls that you always see perched in the foreground in the desert of all cowboy films. A lot of those things were integrated very well, uh, from colour schemes to shapes and patterns and styles. It's a really, really good bit of design work and it ties up really nicely with, with what we did in the cowboy environment. It's just a shame in some ways that we didn't um, flag that up a little bit more obviously by having uh, one of those cow skulls maybe in the sand out at Laredo. I am Tarka Doll, <laughs> an ambassador of the great Vindaloon Empire. That was a wonderful, I loved that gag. I just thought that was inspired because it was so stupid. <laughs> It was great, like, it was, all, it was all names from an Indian menu, you know, Bindi Bhaji and Tarkadal and all this kind of stuff. And I thought they looked really good. I thought you could do a whole series. The audience laughed just from seeing the cat's mouth upside down with this, the teeth going upwards. I mean, it just looked really, it did look like an alien. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't stick. So every time we, every time we come back up, the, 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 um, the eyeball would come off. Craig and Danny had to hand back glass eyeballs to me behind themselves so they couldn't see me. And I was having to do that sort of bad, <laughs> no eyeballs acting. <laughs> and we never, never found them. They'd hand them to me and they'd drop them and, you know, there was quite a few retakes on that. The film noir opening was just done at the back of the studio. Um, I think we... We did put some trays of water down and bounce some lights into that to pretend there was a. We were at the harbour or something, and uh, we hired a car. I think that was our only expense. Rock the car. Well, Craig Charles managed that himself, actually, uh, in the car. I think from his experience, he know how, knew how a car would move. Craig never wanted to half measures. The lava um, was made out of the same substance that was used um, as gunge in shows like Noel's House Party and effectively it's, a, it's an industrial food thickener. Uh, it's, um, if I can product place, <laughs> it's, it's the powder that you get in stuff like cup of soup and pot noodle and when you add boiling water to it it becomes gelatinous. Just to scale that, to not feel You've got a bucket of slop and you're pulling a model out of it. It is very hard. The bug actually never enters the, the, the fake lava. It goes through a slot in the set. But James Davis had rigged up a small gas explosion. So at the point that the star bug vanishes from view, this great gout of flame comes up and you completely buy the fact that it's gone straight into the lava. By the stage it went up for the Emmys, we'd kind of forgotten about it really. If we'd done, gone down very well in this country and it was uh, a period of time afterwards. And I was on a, another job and got the call that we were up for an Emmy and then uh, a call fairly soon after that we'd won it. So it was uh, very exciting, yeah. One always uh, hopes that on any show that you work on that there's, a, there's an award in it somewhere, but uh, the Emmy is probably the, the biggest award in TV and so we were thrilled to get it. Well deserved for Robin Dugdale. It was uh, you know, a strong series and that was probably their strongest script within that. I was in the edit, so I wasn't able to go to that. Um, Rob went um, with Robert uh, and I said to Robert if we win you must phone me uh, I'll have my mobile by my bed it doesn't matter what time phone me and he goes absolutely of course I will went to bed phone by the side of my bed woke up in the morning no message nothing I just thought oh well 
So I thought, I wonder who has one. Um, so I turned on the TV, went to Teletext, uh, and there it was. <laughs> it was, and that's how I found out. It was so extraordinary. And Robert got invited to some showbiz party, a party of forgot or something, bastard.